Now, May was quite the month for owner operator Alan Kitzel, running with his authority out of a home base in Eau Claire, Wisconsin now for getting on a decade and a half as Oak Ridge Transport. That month, he celebrated with family the graduation of one of his brothers with a master's degree in counseling, that brother's son then with the completion of a PhD in chemistry, and the graduation of the brother's daughter from high school. Owner operator Kitz Albert himself, treated for prostate cancer earlier in the year, was celebrating an undetectable blood test marking his freedom from that condition. He put a light blue ribbon in the icing on a brownie cake he made as they all got together at his brother's house to celebrate. I'm Todd Dills, and just what else Kitzhaber put on that cake, which you can see in the cover image for this Overdrive Radio edition, is the reason we're here talking to Alan today. Also in May, Alan Kitzhaber completed a remarkable feat in his 1995 Kenworth T600, Cat 3406E powered. He crossed the 4 million mile mark in that single truck alone, every one of the miles logged under his expert piloting. I only know one other owner to have done that. You all have heard him on the podcast before, of course. It's the Mustang, Mike Crawford, who called me July 1st as he was hitting the prime yard in Springfield at the end of his final run before retirement with a grand total of 4,159,910 miles in the rear view of a 1994 Freightliner powered by a 12.7 Detroit. More on Crawford's final run in a future podcast, be sure of that. You'll find a story marking his passing the 4 million milestone from 2022 linked in the show notes for this podcast and in the post that will house it when it goes live July 15th at overdriveonline.com slash overdrive hyphen radio. Owner-operator Alan Kitzhaber's career stretches back to 1990, his time as an owner-operator some years on with Millis Transfer, where he first took the range of the 1995 T600 as a company driver that year. He then bought the truck from the company itself a few years later. From the current CEO, Dave Millis, in fact, Kitzhaber said. Uh, He's the one that sold the truck to me. Whether he remembers it or not, I don't know. I have the bill of sale. I have all my records from the date I became an owner operator. Yes, he's been meticulous with record keeping in no small way through the years since. Likewise, with modifications to the truck, all aimed at improving business performance and in-cab comfort. You know, some guys customize their truck via paint, chrome, lights, and things like that. Uh, I customize my truck to make it a more comfortable place to be, a more profitable truck, more efficient truck. There's a whole lot to those modifications he's made for certain, detailed in today's episode. Four million miles is a very long way. How many times to the moon and back if you could drive there? What would you guess? answer turns out to be more than eight times and at roughly 60 miles per hour it'd take you well past the hard end of the 14 hour clock to do it 66,666 hours we'll track back through kitzhaber's history a little more quickly than that today on the podcast of course along the way learning plenty about just how the owner operator kept that cat powered t600 humming efficiently for so very long we'll do all that after this quick break so keep tuned Keep your rig running right year-round with Howes Diesel Defender. It provides maximum lubricity to protect your entire system and contains specialized IDX4 detergent to clean and prevent deposits. It safely removes harmful water and guarantees a 5% increase in fuel economy or more. Diesel Defender is now available at your local O'Reilly Auto Parts store. You can also grab a bottle at truck stops nationwide or have it delivered when you shop the Howes store on Amazon. Defend your diesel with Howes. You can find plenty more information about all of Howe's formulations at H-O-W-E-S, howesproducts.com. Here's Alan Kitzhaber, setting up his history trucking. Originally, I'm from Greenwood, Wisconsin, which is about 50 miles to the east. I grew up there on a dairy farm. I've been in Eau Claire since 1990. That's when I started trucking. I started, I went to trucking school in January of 91 and then started uh, trucking for pay in March. All right, you were a company driver to start? I started out as a company driver, yeah, and I did that for seven years until 1998. And then 
Uh, I got into this truck brand new when it was in 1995, January of 1995. And then uh, in August of 98, I bought it from him. At that time, it was Miller's transfer out of Black River Falls. At that time, they were promoting handing their fleet with owner operators and selling trucks to them. And uh, they eventually got away from that, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure that all of the reasons why this wasn't working out for them or, or what the deal was. But, uh, you know, as years went by, there seemed to be fewer and fewer owner operators. My lease ended there in 2009. And uh, I leased on with a company called Transport Designs out of uh, Savage, Minnesota. I was there for a year and a half. And then I got my own operating authority. And then I contract with Menards in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and I make deliveries to their stores, their distribution centers, and pick up from their vendors. I had one other stop in between there. 2002, I leased on with uh, United Van Lines. Did that for one summer. And that was enough to realize that that just wasn't my cup of tea. I went back to working uh, as a lease owner operator for Millis Transfer at that point. You passed the four million mile mark in this truck yourself. Um, but it wasn't all under your ownership at the very start, right? But you were in it from right. the get-go, it sounds like, at Millis as a company driver. Yeah, I was, I was in it at the get-go. And uh, dispatcher I had when I got into that truck and when I started working for Millis Transfer is still employed there. I just talked to him about a month, three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, something like that. And he told okay. me he was going to retire in July. When you bought this truck, uh, I, I can't imagine that it was in your head that um, that you would get to 4 million miles and still be uh, hauling with it uh, with, the, with the same engine and everything. Um, so how did you do that? Well, I, when I bought the truck... I figured, you know, once I had it paid for, I'd be just like any other driver and just buy a new truck or a newer one. But the dot-com bubble hit, and the economy kind of went into the toilet. And I also had thoughts of getting out of trucking, and actually, because I had a background in sales, I was a Radio Shack store manager for nine years. And uh, I got into trucking thinking I would just do it for a couple of years just to see the country and and I would get a real job. And uh, that was 30, 34 years ago. In any case, uh, I just didn't feel comfortable with, you know, the large payments that a new truck would bring me. And so I just figured, well, I'll keep driving it for a while and just see what happens with the economy and hopefully things will improve. And then, then the government introduced these emissions mandates for 2004, mm-hmm. 7, and 2010. And all you heard was nothing bad from mechanics and other people that, that were buying these trucks. You know, the problems they were having, I'm going, well, maybe let's just stick with the truck I've got and really work the bugs out of this stuff. And that story really hasn't changed at all. As time went on, it just got worse and worse. And I've got relatives that are in the trucking business, uh, three cousins, four cousins that at one time were employed by Reem Kenworth. And Good. they all said, just, you know, hang on to the truck you got. Every mechanic I talked to said, just keep the truck you got. You got a good one. Don't screw around with these new ones because of the problems they have with all the emissions and so forth. And I decided that, uh, why not? Let's just do that. I'll just keep driving it as long as I can. Hopefully it'll last until I retire. And uh, then I got to 3 million mile mark and uh, I interviewed with uh, one of the representatives from Caterpillar because Caterpillar has a million miler club. Quite a time ago now, that 3 million mile mark. But you can find that brief interview on the Caterpillar website. I'll post a link to it in the show notes wherever you're listening and in the post that will house this Overdrive Radio podcast for July 15th, 2024 at overdriveonline.com slash overdrive hyphen radio i told him at that time that uh go for four million because it was right about the time that i planned on retiring was about the time i'd hit four million Uh, actually i wanted to retire a little bit earlier than that but when you get that doggone close you just kind of say that i just decided to stick with it for another year or so to get to that point Uh, give me the the full rundown of the specs of this uh kenworth t600 and let's just go through a little bit of the 
just the me- mechanical history on it and, and what you've done to it through the years and the kind of the approach you've taken to preventive maintenance and everything. Um, it's 1995, uh, Kenworth T600. Got a Caterpillar 3406E engine in it. And uh, originally the truck was a 375 multi-torque engine. And when I was in West Virginia, 2001, I believe it was, 2000 or 2001, uh, I had an injector tip break off and got caught between the valve and the valve seat, which caused the valve to bend, which caused the valve guide to break. And you could you could hear when I was driving, you hear this ting, 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 okay. and you hear thunk, 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 as it went through the uh, turbo. And so I'm sitting on the side of the road and uh, got towed to an international dealership, which was a CAT authorized facility as well and uh, the cost to repair it at that time was only like a thousand or two thousand dollars less than it was just to overhaul it and, and caterpillar had something called pick your power program at that time and you could overhaul it as a low horsepower mid horsepower or high horsepower and uh, of course it's always better having more horsepower so i went with the high horsepower option the, I was also due at that particular time with 750,000 miles on it. I was due to put in new bearings and injectors. And so I looked at the cost of doing all of that, and it just it was a no-brainer, just overhaul it. And uh, so I re-rated it uh, to the high horsepower rating. But you, when you did the high horsepower rating, you could go between 475 and 550 horse. And because the transmission in the truck at that time was rated at 1,450 torque, uh, upgrading it to 475 horsepower, the torque, and the, or the 550, the torque rating would be much higher than what the transmission was rated at. So originally I rated it at 475 and just took it easy going down the road. And that lasted for about a year or two until the transmission started getting a little bit loose. And I, it had about a million miles on it. So it wasn't like uh, I really damaged the transmission with that extra horsepower, at least not too much anyway. So then I upgraded to a higher torque transmission and then re-rated the engine to 550, and that's where it's been ever since. So it probably was around 2003 that I did that. The transmission has been overhauled once since then by the shop that I get my truck work done. I got more than 2.1 million on that overhaul so far, and the transmission is still, you'd never know it, still tight. That's changing the oil every 500,000 miles with synthetic oil. Well, engine oil, transmission, rear ends, everything's synthetic. Well, every 500,000 on the transmission and rear end. Okay. And yeah. on, and the, en- the engine is every 50,000. As far as overhauls go, I did an overhaul at, I did well, the one at 750, then I did one at 2.4 million. The next one was 3.6 million. So I got almost 1.7 million out of that first overhaul. And That's what wild. happened there is I, I, I had an injector, or not an injector, or a liner seal failed. And I took it to the Caterpillar shop. We got to tear it all apart in order to get to that. And the mechanic says there's still cross hatching left on the cylinders. And the bearings, they don't look that bad. You know, you could put new rings and bearings in this, just keep going. And I says, no, nah, we'll just overhaul it because you get a warranty if you do that. Then at 3.6 million, I had a head gasket go. And again, you're in a situation where you tear it all down, all the labor and stuff, and they put it all together. Well, you don't have a warranty after they get all that done. You've spent a lot of money, so might as well just overhaul it. And uh, the the engine itself, mechanically, was in great shape. Still had right. cross hatchings in the cylinders. The bearings looked good. Injectors were good. I did, on the last overhaul, I did replace the injectors one time because I had one that was starting to tick on me. And rather than just replace the one injector, I just put a whole set of fix in. But as far as other things that I've done to the truck over the years uh, to try and make it, uh, you know, some guys customize their truck via paint, chrome, lights, and things like that. Uh, I customize my truck to make it a more comfortable place to be, a more profitable truck more efficient truck. And in doing so, some of the things I did is put an APU on it for air conditioning and you have an alternator on there so that helps charge the batteries overnight and keep them up. Uh, 
Uh, I also Is it a have di- a diesel heat. diesel fired APU. Yeah. Tri pack APU, but I have a pro heat on there too, which heats my coolant and heats the engine uh, as well as keeping the cab warm during the winter. Uh, the other thing that I put on there is I have an Arctic Fox inline fuel heater, which heats the fuel prior to getting to the engine. And since I put that on, I haven't used any kind of diesel fuel treatment. And that's so that's been 13, 14 years that's been on there that I haven't. I mean, you can take the lid off the uh, fuel tank and you look in there and you can see that the fuel's gelled up, but yet the truck starts and runs great because it heats up that fuel prior to getting it to the engine. That's okay. huge in the wintertime. And the other thing I have, too, is an auxiliary fuel tank that is used for the pro heat and the tri-pack. They get their fuel from that separate tank. There is a tax advantage doing that because you're not using that fuel for running down the road. There is a tax credit that your accountant can give you at the end of the year. It's not huge, but it, it, it helps add up. But the advantage of doing that is I can stick fuel in that tank that is like a number one diesel or a premium diesel or some highly treated diesel that's not going to gel up on me. That I know that those two those two units I can get going. If I can get those two units going, then the truck can go. That was really important. It's a small tank. It's uh, 14 gallons is all it is. That's very, very helpful. Um, I also have something called a fuel preparator, which I don't know if you're familiar with those or not. It's a little bit. Fast system. Okay. The air dog bought them out. Originally, it was a fuel preparator. Air dog bought them out. So that's the name that you see on them now. But I put one of those on 15 years ago or so. And okay. that just helps take the uh, air out of the fuel. And uh, I also have OPS fill, oil filtration system on the truck. And I change those filters every 25,000 miles is what they recommend. It's a 10-inch filter that I'm using on it. And I change the oil on the engine because I'm using synthetic oil as well as using a bypass filter. I change the oil every 50,000 miles. And I've done that since the truck was new. Originally, the truck had a spinner oil filter, bypass oil filtration system on it. And uh, that ended up just uh, started making a bunch of noise on me, vibrating. And so I I didn't know if it was failing or what it was, so I just changed it up. And that's been working just fine since. Another thing I have on there is a Gronaveld automatic greaser that's been on there since the truck was brand new. You go to their website, they have all kinds of greasers, but uh, I've had that on there and since the truck was new and the, the longevity that you get from those greasable components is much greater with that automatic greaser on there than someone who greases their truck even every single month. Every or every 15,000 miles or whatever they choose to do. I mean, there are some guys out there, they probably grease the truck once a week. And if they are, then they're, they're doing real good. Right. It, pay, it probably pays off for them to do that, but I don't know of anybody that does that every week. But this gets greased constantly. Longtime owner operator Gordon Alkire long swore by what he called a closed greasing system, one he built himself and shared the details of with Overdrive years back. It's not automatic, per se, yet solves the issue of needing to get up under the truck to do the work of greasing. Find a link to that story from way back in 2012 in the July 15th post housing this podcast when it goes live at overdriveonline.com slash overdrive hyphen radio. I have a pressure pro higher pressure monitoring system right, right. that I've had in there for a long, long time. It was back in the day when Flying J uh, used to have... They still do have a point card thing to pilot, but they used to have a little catalog where you'd order stuff after you got a certain number of points. And I got up to where I had a lot of points saved up. I didn't use them. I used that to buy a pressure probe. Put gotcha. that on the truck. That's, you know, for the guys that are listening, uh, when that changed over from a catalog system to a point system, I don't know when that was. It's been a long time. That Pressure Pro has been on the truck for probably 15 years. Or uh, 15, maybe 20 years. I've been under 20 years. I have a power inverter in the truck with a microwave and a TV, a DVD player, DVD player right. just for creature comfort kind of things. Uh, 
uh, I have a dash cam in the truck. That saved my butt a couple of times. Uh, and a couple of hit and runs, or one one was a hit and run, the other one was an attempted hit and run, until they realized that uh, I could drive as fast as they could. <laughs> well, another thing I did in the truck, one of the first things I did to the truck is I put, uh, I'm sure you've seen these vents that RVs have in them, they're fur vents, and many of them have fans in them. That's one of the first things I did was put that in my truck in the sleeper area. And then you can buy these screens to put in your windows. Breezeway, I think, maybe was the name company that sold them. I don't know if they still sell them or not. Uh, but you put that in and turn the fan on, you can draw some air through the truck, which is uh, really makes it a lot more comfortable, especially yep. in the spring and the fall when the temperatures aren't extreme in one direction or the other. And that was just another attempt for me to try and economical and cut down on my yep. idle time increase my comfort in the vehicle as long as you're not parked next to a an idling reefer sucking all that uh, diesel fuel in there <laughs> diesel exhaust into your cab right that's one of the downsides um yeah. to uh to that system is years ago there was a lot more idling but now there's not near as much idling anymore and because of that because the idling is reduced uh you know, you don't have that problem as much as you used to. That used to be a problem, or there was times when I couldn't even use it. I think it was 2011 uh, or 12, one of the two. Is I went from having a twin drive or twin screw drive or whatever you want to call it, dual drive axle truck, mm -hmm. single drive axle truck with a tag axle. The two big things that that gained me, fuel economy of about four to five tenths of a mile to the gallon. And it re I also, at the same time, I took off the eight steel rim single drive axle tires and put on four super single tires with aluminum rims. Right. The combination of these two things reduced the truck weight by 1,200, which, which was huge. The fuel economy over the last 10 years running average is 6.93. The last five years, it's not that high. Okay. I had a couple of years in there would have been in uh, 2013 and 2014, where I got this bug to drive 57 miles an hour all the time, 58 miles an hour, something like that, just to see what I'd get for fuel economy. And in 2013, I got 8.04, and in 2014, wow. I got 7.86. 7 and uh, and it depends a little bit on the trailers you're pulling. And I was pulling flatbeds, vans different kind of trailers that uh, were not necessarily aerodynamic. They could have pulled just dry vans all the time. Uh, at that speed, I'd have been over eight miles per gallon constantly. But over the last, say, five years, it's, I can go right down the list for the last five years here. 6.67, 6.67, 6.65, 6.56, 6.39. Yeah, pretty uh, consistent. Pretty I pull reefers in the wintertime a little bit when they have freezable stuff. I lease reefers during those winter months, so I'll pull them just a little bit. Okay. Otherwise, I pull dry vans, and I pull flatbeds, and they have some specialty trailers. Uh, I don't pull all of their specialty trailers. They have some specialty trailers that are for delivering uh, trusses to job sites, and I don't make okay. job site deliveries, so that's, that's why I don't pull those. But I do pull another trailer which I think you saw, um, one of the pictures I sent you has a picture of that, but it doesn't have, it has pallets on the trailer instead of the finished product. It's a triple decker trailer, and it is much like pulling a uh, car hauler trailer. It's just not very aer aerodynamic. You, yep. you get hurt quite a bit as far as fuel economy. And actually, I pull those quite often. I do those probably close to 50 percent of the time that could be the reason for your uh one of the reasons anyway for your uh for your 6.67 uh, uh, miles to the gallon these days rather than eight yeah well it has yeah. a lot to, to do with it yeah. Yeah. and the other thing is i'm driving a little faster now than i was then just because uh, matter of efficiency uh, yeah. as far as 
you know, if you drive slower, you can't get the load delivered. Yeah. And you have to wait till the next day to get delivered. It's, it all depends. Yeah. So you have to make that, you have to do the math on it and figure out what works best. And there's a lot that you've done uh, and it all adds up to a big picture. I'm just wondering what, what your thought would be. If there's any, if there's any one thing that you did that you feel like uh, kind of led to this, uh, to this particular milestone, uh, what do you think had the biggest impact on the longevity of this truck? Maintenance program, just plain and simple, your maintenance program, because you are not going to run a truck. There's trucks out there that are three years old that are probably worse condition than my truck is. Just because the guys don't take care of it. But the key is if you want to run a truck long term, number one, number one, big number one, something's broke, something needs to be fixed, fix it now. You don't wait. Yeah. You wait, things just add up, and pretty soon you got yourself a pile of junk with a huge bill, and you go, I don't want to do it. I'll just trade it in and buy a new truck. Kitsaber's approach to maintenance, if you haven't gathered, is of the proactive variety, to say the least. I can't tell you the number of times that they found little things here or there that if I hadn't done this, would have left me sitting on the side of the road or sitting in a way station someplace right. having to have road service come out and work on my truck. In a future edition of Overdrive Radio, we'll hear more about his longtime go-to maintenance partner there in the area around Eau Claire, Wisconsin, home base for Oak Ridge Transport, operating with authority, pulling for that solid customer in Menards now for many years. They've no doubt got a steady hand in Alan Kitzhaber. It was a big congrats to him for hitting that 4 million mile mark in the 1995 Kenworth T600, customized with efficiency in mind and with the right maintenance plan for its longevity. Here's looking forward to more from the owner-operator, so keep tuned. Find some further pictures of the rig in the post that will house this podcast live at the world-famous OverdriveOnline.com July 15th. That's OverdriveOnline.com slash Overdrive hyphen radio. Big thanks for listening, wherever you find the podcast. Overdrive Radio is on Spotify and SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Tune in, Podcast Addict, most any listening platform. Subscribe so you don't miss an episode, and you can find me and all of our episodes via the world-famous OverdriveOnline.com slash Overdrive hyphen radio. Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, the voice of the American trucker. It's edited and produced by me, Todd Dills, with the acoustic guitar and other support of trucker songwriter Long Paul Paul Marhofer. The theme is Legend of the Snake Man by Marhofer. Featuring the guitar work of Travis, the Snake Man himself, Wamek, Terry Tosox, Richardson on bass, keys by Tishomingo, Jim Whitehead, and on drums, Andrew Marshall. The podcast is backed up further by Overdrive's own social media coordinator, Jasmine Campbell, news editor, Matt Cole, executive editor, Alex Lockie, and video editors, Lawson Rudisel and Andrew Gwynn. Until next time, keep it bright out there.